to be here and to see you and to be with you today. Uh, we've been talking over the last few weeks on unity and various aspects of what unites us and, and what that unity actually is in Christ Jesus. And today we're going to talk about unity amidst disagreement. And those two things sound like they can't really coexist, but there are scriptures that tell us about when we have disagreements in certain areas. And so the subtitle of our lesson this morning is Traditions, Opinions, and Personal Convictions. So uh, we're going to revisit some things before we really dive into the meat of our lesson today. Starting with this, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And this was mentioned in Brother Monty's lesson that we're to bear with one another in love. This is a part of what unites us. And that bearing with one another means to put up with one another or to tolerate one another. And, and that happens in every family, doesn't it? Within every body or social group or community, there are going to be disagreements. There's going to be personality quirks where we get on each other's nerves and we annoy each other, right? Amen. We all annoy each other at times. And so Paul tells us we have to put up with one another and to do that in love. We're also told to have a family like love that causes us to value one another. And so the words kindly affectionate uh, could be rendered to have a family like affection for one another. And we're to do that with brotherly love and in honor. And that word means value. And so we value one another. That's part of what unites us. Thirdly, we're to treat one another with kindness and compassion. And sometimes that's difficult to do because, again, we have people with personality quirks and they rake our nerves and, and, and we're all that way, aren't we? And there are things that upset us. And what are we to do? We're to have the love for one another that we have for ourselves to love one another as we do ourselves. And when we do that, we always have compassion for ourselves, right? We want kindness to be displayed toward us, and so we're to also show that toward one another. So these are some of the foundations of unity. Now, are there exceptions to this? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Just This is three verses later. So this was Colossians 3.12. Three verses later, Paul says this, And let the peace of God... Rule in your hearts to which you also were called in one body and be thankful. So think about this precept or this concept of ruling for a moment. There's something that is to reign. That is, it governs. And it governs where? In the heart. And what is it that is to govern us? He says, let the peace of God rule or reign in your hearts to which you were also called in one body. So let's unpack that for a moment. Within this body, we are to allow the peace of God that's been distributed toward us to also flow out of us toward each other, and that is to be a ruling principle of what we do within the body. We are called to peace. And so when we decide, how am I supposed to interact with, one, with, with, with my brother? What are we supposed to do when there's sin? What are we supposed to do when there's disagreement? Well, this is the ruling principle, okay? This rules over all of it. We're called to peace. So no matter how we go about trying to navigate these disagreements, here's what we do know. Whatever we do needs to be done in the spirit of peace. And so we're trying to make peace within the body. That's the governing principle of unity is that we're all called to peace. So is there a time when that just can't happen? So Jason talked to us about three things. Uh, doctrine as it relates to the gospel. He talked about worship and he talked about morality. Now there are extenuating circumstances, what we might call nuclear situations, where we wouldn't forbear someone in love. Now it doesn't mean that we hate them. It doesn't mean that we... Uh, treat them bad or we, or we take kindness off the table. But there are nuclear situations where we have people that may do certain things where Paul gives us a certain admonition in how to handle those situations. So Romans 16, 17, now I urge you, brethren, note or mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to what? The doctrine. What's the doctrine? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ in particular. And so he says, when you've learned, what you've learned is the doctrine. And when people cause divisions and offenses contrary to that doctrine, you need to note them and avoid them. So we've got this idea of, of receiving one another, of accepting one another, of having brotherly and family-like love. But he says, you know, if somebody's causing division within the body, you need to avoid that person. 
Now, is that something that we can walk around with like a sword and cut off whoever we want? No, these are, again, these are extenuating circumstances. Notice he says, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the symbol. Well, who are we talking about? Are we talking about somebody that has a disagreement with what we believe? No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who is teaching a different gospel who is teaching a different way, and they're trying to pull people away from Christ and toward them. So let's not, get, uh, let's not misunderstand what he's saying here. He's not saying if somebody disagrees with what we believe, then we need to avoid that person. He's talking about someone who is actively pulling saints away from the flock. That's an extenuating circumstance. Now, another thing when it comes to morality that we see in 1 Corinthians 5 is when somebody is in immorality and it is commonly known and this person fails to repent or they, or they won't repent, he says, you shouldn't glory in that. You shouldn't tolerate that. In fact, you shouldn't put up with it. You should hope that that person might be removed from you until they repent. And so this, again, is an extenuating circumstance. This isn't when somebody commits a sin, cut them off. Right? Or we'd just be cutting each other off all of the time because we all sin, right? This is an extenuating circumstance. So again, we have this in worship. And again, here in worship, we're not talking about cutting someone off. But in 1 Corinthians 14, he identifies what we might call the rules of the assembly. And when we say the rules of the assembly, we're talking about there are certain guidelines by which we look at an assembly and how we conduct and organize an assembly. And at the end of that... He makes this statement, and this is a very powerful and also loud statement. He says, if anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. So we look back through 1 Corinthians 14 and we see certain things regulated like tongue speaking. Uh, we see that nobody can talk in a tongue unless it's interpreted. We see that women are not to be teachers within the assembly. It doesn't mean they're not to be teachers outside the assembly, but they're not to be teachers inside the assembly. That's something that he writes about. Uh, he talks about them not even asking questions during the teaching portion. And so we may buck against that and say, well, you know what? That's not fair. Paul was sexist. And Paul, he, he dispels all that by saying this. If somebody thinks they're a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit. Now, why does he say that? Because it's not about intellect and it's not about talent because obviously God equipped people that were prophets to do what? To teach. He, he equipped people with gifts of the Spirit to do what? To use those gifts to the glory of God. So he's saying, even if you are a prophet or you're someone that is spiritually gifted, being given a gift by God, it doesn't mean you can ignore these things. Why? Because these are the Lord's commandment about how the assembly is to be conducted. So let him acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's commandment. It's not Paul's suggestions. It's not Paul's bias. It's what God told Paul to say. And here's how you handle that. Now, what do you do if somebody decides not to abide by those rules? Do you say, well, you're not a Christian anymore? Or you're not my brother anymore? What does he say? If anyone ignores this, they themselves will be ignored. Ignored how? Like we don't talk to them? We don't acknowledge their existence? No, he's talking about within the assembly. If someone's to address the congregation and break these rules that have been set up by God, we don't acknowledge that person. This isn't about cutting off, but again, there are black and white issues when it comes to those things, doctrine, morality, and worship. Now, are there areas where things are not black and white? Yeah, there are. And I know, we like black and white. Black and white's easy to navigate. It's easy to categorize. But we have to, be, we have to admit from looking at scriptures, there are things that are just not black and white. And so we have things to govern that as well. So as Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Let's break this down a little bit. So first off, Paul is pleading with them. Why? Because this is really important. I'm pleading with you. That's strong language. And I'm pleading with you to do these things. I want you to speak the same thing. I don't want there to be anything that divides you. I want you to be perfectly joined together. Perfectly united in what? The same mind and the same judgment. Now, do you suppose if two people, just take two people in this room, sat across from the table with one another and talked for two hours that they would agree on everything? No. 
I, I would say you take a husband and wife and set them across the table. They're not going to agree on everything. You take siblings, you put them, you get the point. There's no two people that agree on everything. So why would he say this when it's impossible? Because when it comes to doctrine, we can all speak the same thing and be undivided. Why? Because there's an absolute foundation and an absolute standard of God's word which, which to operate from. When it comes to worship, it's the same. When it comes, uh, what was the third one I was talking about a moment ago? I already forgot. When it comes to morality, there's a foundation there. There's no, there's no outside the box where we can say, yeah, but, because God has already given us the absolutes. But then there are things like tradition, liberties, and personal conviction, not conviction itself, but personal convictions, where that's more of a gray area. And those are the things we're going to disagree on or might disagree on. And it's okay to disagree on those things. And we're going to try to work through that and look at God's word and come to an agreement on them. But that's not always going to happen. So what do you do? And what is tradition? We talk about tradition a lot. You know, this, this tradition subject was a great, a great percentage of the Gospels was Jesus dealing with Jewish tradition and with Pharisaical tradition and just tradition in general. A lot of his problems that he was dealing with was because people had took tradition and they'd made it doctrine. They had moved it over into the wrong category. So let's just define tradition before we dive into it. I know that's small. Just once you see this from Webster's Dictionary, this is just a generic definition of tradition. It is how the Bible uses the word tradition. <coughs> it means an inherited, established, or customary pattern of thought, action, or behavior. So that's the definition of tradition that it gives us sub-explanation of such as a religious practice or social custom. So let's think about this. An inherited, established, or customary pattern. So a synonym for tradition might be custom. We may use the word custom. That's our custom. That's our uh, accepted practice, we might say. So he says inherited. Well, does that mean genealogical? No. Not genealogical, it's not DNA. We're not talking about DNA here. We're talking about traditions that are passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. Now, now who, who is it that governs those a lot of times? Well, it can be parents or grandparents or great-grandparents as some traditions will pass along several generational lines. So that could be the source of tradition. Uh, the source of tradition could be uh, societal and when I say societal I don't mean American society I mean society being the social group that we're accustomed to interacting in so think of this congregation as being a society if you will and some of those traditions may be governed by what we've understood the group to believe is acceptable that could be another place where traditions can come from and it was certainly where the Jewish traditions uh, were coming from. They were looking around, they were looking at the religious leaders, they were saying what's the acceptable way to practice traditions, and they all just accepted that that's just the way things are. Now, is that wrong inherently? No, it's not wrong. I'm just trying to explain where traditions come from. Uh, traditions may also come from mentors. Uh, and, and by mentor, I mean somebody that's taken you under their wing and they begin to teach you about life and teach you about how to act and how to think and what your attitude should be. So that's another thing. And Jesus will address that and we'll look at that in just a moment about mentors. But, you know, another place that tradition can come from is the Bible. And so there are traditions that actually come from the Bible. And the problem is people look at tradition as a very negative thing. And tradition is not always a negative thing, but it can be if it's not from the right place. So let's think about parents for just a moment. And I hear this a lot. You only believe what you believe because that's what your parents believed. Now, on the surface of that, that's insulting, right? That I would be so naive that I would believe what I believe only because my parents believe it. Now, here's the problem, though. It's, it may be insulting and it may be offensive, but some of that's true, right? For every one of us, some of that's true. I mean, we, there, in some ways, we, we have a difficult time escaping the influence of our parents, and so rather than get insulted, let's just dispel the word only here, okay? You only believe, okay? I don't only believe what I believe because my parents believe it, but there's a lot of things that I do believe because that's what my parents believe. Or my grandparents believed it. I was raised by them too, so I've got all these influences in my life. So just to say, well, that's not true is unfair. It's true, but let's understand something. It's not wrong to believe what our parents believe, but our faith needs to be deeper than that. Our faith doesn't need to be in our parents, okay? 
Our faith needs to be in the Word of God. And so whatever I do decide to do and I believe is right can't just be because my father or my grandfather or someone else's father or grandfather believed or taught that. Secondly, our parents' belief can be and are sometimes and are often wrong. And we have to admit that. Well, why would we say something like that? Well, because every one of us are wrong at times, right? And so we have to understand just because our parents say something doesn't necessarily mean it's absolutely true. And that can influence us. Why? Because we learn the traditions when? When we're about this tall. How much does a person who's this tall really understand about the world, about the Bible? How much cognitive ability do they really have to sit and look and view a tradition and say, is this wrong or right, or is this good or this bad? They don't. So we learn the tradition at a much earlier age than we actually could understand it. And so we may not ever question it, and that's the point here. We need to question why we do what we do. And if the only reason, let me repeat that, the only reason we do what we do is because our parents did it, we still need to question it. We, we really need to question it. But just because we believe the same thing as our parents doesn't mean our beliefs are wrong. That, that's a straw man argument is what it is. Someone's just trying to say, well, you, they're trying to get you to question your faith. And, and, you know, when kids reach a certain age, sometimes they have a knee-jerk reaction to what their parents taught them. They throw everything out that their parents taught them. And that's also not productive. That's actually a terrible thing. How do I know that? Because I did that for a while. I tried it my way, and it didn't work out so well. So don't throw everything out. But, yes, take the Word of God, sit down, and question. But you know what? Maybe there is a reason why our parents did things, and it wasn't just because their parents did it. Maybe they did that because that's what God's Word told them to do. And those are the traditions that we must follow. They're not optional traditions. These are the practices that are built on the foundation of a greater principle. And so Paul writes here and says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught. Now, what does that mean, which you have been taught? You know what the word doctrine means? That which is taught. That's what the word doctrine means. So what's he saying? There are traditions built upon doctrine and you are to hold them, to possess them, to not let them go. And notice what has been taught came from the word that they spoke and their letters. So when he says to hold the traditions, it was the traditions that they had given to the churches that were passed down to them from the Holy Spirit by the authority of of Jesus Christ. Now, when our traditions are formed on that, we don't argue about the tradition itself. Now, maybe there's nuances to how we practice that that may be in a different category. Jesus told us that the truth would divide parent children relationships. Did you know that? He said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Now, what Jesus is not saying is, I came to divide families, but here's a reality. There will be times when if you stand on the truth, it will divide relationships. That's a reality. And that's what Jesus said would happen. And I believe he uses father and mother and these other familial relationships because those are the greatest relationships we think would never be broken. But he said truth divides those relationships. And a man's foes may be, his enemies may be those that are in his own house. And here's the most important thing. He who loves father or mother more than me. More than me. See, Jesus says, you've got to make a choice. Who are you going to be loyal to? And this applies in this discussion about what we believe and what we think is right and what, how we live. Is Who is my loyalty to? Is it to my parents or is it to Jesus? And if it's over on this side, we need to move away from that side. Now... Sometimes the parent and Jesus are one, right? That's what, we're, that's what we hope, right? That the parent and Jesus, they're united and we're united with Jesus and so we're united with our parents. But that's not always reality. And so we have to make a choice to be loyal to Jesus and to his teachings. <coughs> Jesus said this, This people draws near to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me and in vain they do worship me, teaching his doctrines. <clears throat> the commandments of men. So for all you young people who are used to texting, this isn't yelling up here. That's not why it's in all caps. It's because it's a prophecy. 
And in certain translations, the prophecies are all caps. Just, just side note here, he's not yelling this. But I want to see that there are three things here, okay? There's the heart, there's the mouth, right? And then there's worship. So there's things going on here that would reflect worship, right? But he said that worship is empty because the doctrines are the doctrines and commandments of men, not the doctrines and commandments of God. So all these things end up blending together at some point. Worship, doctrine, tradition, all those things. He's addressing their traditions, and those traditions had the wrong foundation. And because they were more loyal to their self and to their family and to their social, their society, it had taken them away from God, and they were still doing things that were religious and worshiping God, but it was all empty. It was all worthless. So let's talk about mentors and the impact that mentors can have on our traditions. In Luke chapter 6, 39, this is a very familiar passage to us. He spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? He's not trying to be unkind to blind people here. He's just giving an analogy that will help us understand a concept. If somebody was behind the wheel of a car and they could not see, I don't mean their sight is blurry, I mean they could not see, would you get in with them and allow them to drive you somewhere? Nobody would do that, right? Nobody. Why? Because we're okay. You can do a lot of things to be blind, but what you can't do is lead other people with your eyes. And so that's the point he's making. Sometimes we give a blind person the driver's seat, and that can have a problem for us, okay? When it, when it comes to what we believe and what we practice, he's talking about mentorship. So listen, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who's perfectly trained or completely or thoroughly trained will be like his teacher. This is just the impact that, we, that, that will be uh, on us because of who our mentor is. So I trained with several men when I was doing evangelism. I trained with Jerry McCorkle. I trained with Sean Zeebach. Uh, I've, I've done some smaller training with other guys. And every one of those men have had an impact on what I believed and what I practiced and what I did. And you know what? I've had to question every one of those things no matter how much I love them. Because this is true. When somebody trains you, especially when you're a clean slate, and they train you, and they train you thoroughly, you're going to believe what they believe and maybe never question it because of the sentiment or emotional attachment you have to that mentor. You know what that is? Dangerous. Because what if that mentor is blind? That's his point. What if your mentor is blind? Then you're going to be blind. And you're not going to know that you're blind. You'll just believe what they believe and think it's right and never really be able to see the truth. So he continues this thought by saying this, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and but do not perceive the beam in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the beam that is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the beam from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. We associate this with judgment, and rightly so, because it is about judgment, making judgment. But do you see how many times he uses the word I? He uses it over and over. You will see clearly your eye has a beam, your eye has a speck, your brother's eye, your eye. It's all about what we see. It's all about what you see. And what do you start that out with? If you're blind, you can't see. And sometimes you're blind because you got a beam. And you and your blindness want to go do surgery on someone else and pull a speck out of their eye when you've got a tube of four sticking out of your head? It's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. What was their beam? Tradition. That was their beam. How do you know that? Because he just talked about it right here. It was tradition. It was things they learned from their mentors that were blind, that made them blind. And now they're practicing what they've been told to practice because it was generational. And now they're using wrong judgment because they believe their traditions are a foundation to operate in the area of doctrine and morality and worship. And tradition is not the foundation of those things. It's built upon what founded them but they got it all upside down and backwards and they viewed life through what was generational and passed down. 
See, Paul says this, See to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world, rather than in accordance with Christ. Not every tradition that someone teaches us is against the will of God, but there are some things that are against the will of God that are not according to what we've been delivered, and those things, he says, can take us captive. They can take us captive. Because what you believe to be true has tremendous power on your life. Not just what's true, but what you believe to be true. Because you operate, you act, you think, you talk based on what you believe to be true. And so if the truth is not in line with that, we got a big problem. You know what we call that? Not in touch with reality. That's the problem. So we have to be loyal, again, to what is taught in Scripture when we decide on tradition. So what is our guide for practice? And this has often been said. I've said this. I've taught this. In fact, I taught this multiple times when I was doing the five part as a young evangelist. One of my older evangelists asked me one day, he said, Is there a command necessary or uh, example or necessary inference that teaches us to use command, example, or necessary inference? And I was speechless. I had nothing to say. You know why? Because we just kind of made that up. I mean, now, are these things, uh, is there a foundation here? Yes. Commands, obviously, right? Obviously, commands are authoritative. What about examples? Every one of them? Which examples are authoritative and which ones aren't? You say, well, all of them are. Well, we'll look at that in a second. So when we're coming up with traditions, which biblical New Testament examples are authoritative and which ones are not? Okay, now here's a big one, necessary inference. Who gets to decide which inferences are necessary and which ones aren't? Who decides that? That's a slippery slope, isn't it? Very slippery. But this one right here, absolutely. And this one right here, when it's founded on this right here, then the examples are authoritative. So when we look at examples of New Testament practice, when we see a command being lived out and applied by the New Testament, we go, okay, that's how they did what's been commanded. Those are authoritative. But you know what? There are a lot of things the New Testament church did that we don't do. And I don't hear anybody thinking that they're really what, exactly what should we, we should be doing. So in Acts 4.32, the Christians sold their land and houses and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. Is that our example? Why do you have houses? Why do you have land? It's an example. Is it an authoritative example? What about this one? Christians had a public book burning in Ephesus. When's the last time we had a public book burning here in Pampa? Does anybody do that? Is that a binding, authoritative example? How about this one? Timothy was circumcised so he could go and work with the Jews. Does every evangelist then have to be circumcised? It's an example, right? We see that New Testament Christians did it. Paul preached until midnight. We've got a long ways to go. It's an example. So what's the point? You see, what's your point? Every one of these things are good examples that are built on greater principles. Why did Christians sell their land and houses and lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet? I'll tell you why. Because they loved their brothers and sisters and cared about their welfare, and it was the only thing they could do to make sure everybody was taken care of. That's the example. Christians had a public book burning. Why'd they do that? Because God commands us to burn our books? No, because they were cutting off the hand that offends them. They were plucking out the eye that offends them. They were showing that they were repentant and they were removing that which made a provision for their flesh that would gratify their lust. There was a greater principle that drove the tradition, the action, the application. And there are things like that. And my point is this, we've got to use righteous judgment. We may see somebody doing something a little bit differently because of a greater principle and we may look at it and go, well, we don't see that specifically as an example in the New Testament. But what if it's built on a greater principle? Did Jesus ever address that? He certainly did. In fact, he addressed it in 
reference to traditions. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now we'll deal with this in just a moment. So he says that you're very tedious. You're very tedious in tithing. Why, why, why would I use the word tedious? Because this is mint, and what is translated as anise is actually not anise, it's dill, dill seed, and then fennel is cumin, fennel. Okay? You've seen fennel on your pizza, I'm sure. Little bitty seeds. They're very small. Think about this. If you had a jar of this and you were going to divide it out and you were going to give a tenth of that, that would be very tedious, wouldn't it? Would you count it? Probably not. You'd probably weigh it, right? But what standard would you use to weigh it? The ounce? The gram? How tedious are we going to be? They were very, very tedious. Why? Because they didn't want to break the law. But then you know what he said? You'll strain out a gnat. You'll strain out a gnat. Now, strain doesn't mean choke. Strain means like we put something through a strainer. And why would they strain out a gnat? Because gnats love grape juice. You know what they drink all the time? Grape juice. And so, so they wouldn't break the law. Whatever grape juice container, wine container, they'd put a piece of cloth over it and they would strain out the gnat so they didn't break the law because the law says don't eat a gnat. Very tedious. But he said you'll swallow a camel. Now were they really eating camel? I don't know. Camel was against the law to eat. It chewed the cud but it did not have a cloven hoof so they couldn't eat it. His point is this, there's these little tedious things that you're very, very astute on. You, you understand that you can't do that, but there's these large things that are very much in your face and easy to see, and you're neglecting those. The weightier matters of the law, like what? Judgment, mercy, and faith. Here's the thing. If I don't emphasize justice and mercy and faith in my life, all the tedious law-keeping will do me no good. Because I'm missing the greater principles of who God is and what God wants from me. They were blind. Doing religious things to the honor and glory of God, but blind. Because they were so stuck on tradition, they missed that there were greater principles within what God had told them to do. John 7, 21, Jesus answered and said, I did one work and you all marvel. And that work he's talking about is healing someone on the Sabbath day. Moses therefore gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, Abraham. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Okay, let's break down what's happening here. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath day, and these Pharisees are watching him. You know why they're watching him? They want to accuse him. And so the moment he heals this man, they're like, ha, got him. He worked on the Sabbath day. And you know what he's saying? You're hypocrites. You're such hypocrites. He said, you circumcise on the Sabbath day. Well, why would they do that? I'll tell you why. Because there was a law that said the baby had to be circumcised on the eighth day of life. And a lot of times that eighth day of life was the Sabbath. So what were they going to do? Not circumcise them? Well, we can't not do that because that's what puts them in a covenant relationship with God. But it's the Sabbath day and we can't break the Sabbath day. And so what do they do? They, they use righteous judgment and saying, okay, this is fine to do on the Sabbath day because it's a greater principle, right? They use that judgment and he says, but you don't give me that same grace? It's okay to circumcise someone on the Sabbath, but it's not okay for me to make someone who has been in bondage to a sickness all their life well? On the Sabbath day? See, they were blind. They weren't using righteous judgment. They were judging. They were judging. But he says, you're judging according to appearance. What does that mean? We may say, don't judge a book by its cover. Why? Read the book. What's inside the book? What is the intention of the author? What did he say in the book? Don't judge a situation according to appearance so a lot of times i know i've been guilty of that i've looked at a situation when i don't feel good about that i don't like that i experienced that for two solid weeks because i'll tell you things are done differently in india the first thing that happened that morning that sunday morning in malapur was that four men got up to lead the song instead of one and my brain is going how are they going to do this and then they all grab microphones and the microphones were abrasive. They turned the bass way up and the treble way down. It goes, 
You know what people were doing? Worshiping God. But that's not what we're used to. And so I'm thinking at that moment, there's nothing right about what's happening here. Preach with the translator. It doesn't feel right. And, and that's a lot of what happens. People do things that are different than what we do, and it doesn't feel right, and so we just go, well, it's wrong then. Don't judge according to appearance. Use righteous judgment. We must ask the question, is what is happening here violate the will of God? Is it built upon a greater principle that we see taught? And that's going to take maturity. And that's why we need leaders, we need teachers to be talking about these things. Because not everybody has the same level of discernment. There are some people that understand the simple things. There are some people that understand those more discernment level uh, concepts or conversations. And we have to give the people that are not as mature some grace as they're learning. As they're learning. Why? Because their senses have not been exercised yet to discern both good and evil. So as Brother Nathan read from us from, uh, for us from 1 Corinthians 8, 4, and 7, you notice that Paul points this out. He says, now concerning the things offered to idols, we know. Who's we? Everybody that knows. It's everybody that knows. We know what? That an idol is nothing. But did everybody know that? No, he points that out. What does he say? However, there's not in everyone that knowledge. So what's his point? You can't just operate off what you know. Because if you do that, you'll hurt the people that don't. You'll hurt the people that don't know. And he said their conscience is not the same. Their level of discernment is not the same. Their conscience is weak. And he said if their conscience is weak and you do something out of your knowledge but not considering them in love, you may wound their weak conscience and destroy your brother for whom Christ died. And now what have you done? Oh, you did what you believe was right, but you hurt someone in the process. And so when we talk about unity and disagreement, this is the key. So we're going to go through some verses in Romans 14 as we close. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. And when we're talking about opinions here, we're not talking about just generically. We're talking about religious opinions, that is, personal convictions. He says, accept that person who is weak in faith, which is very similar to the language that he uses here about the conscience being weak and about the strong and the weak. So just wanted to point that out. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt or to despise the one who does not eat. <coughs> and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Verse 5, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one, listen, each one should be fully convinced by his own mind or in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it to honor the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So a lot of information there. We're going to try to really simplify this this morning. So there are two brothers that he's talking about here, a weaker brother, someone that's weaker in faith, and here are the convictions of the weaker brother. And don't get hung up that there's one person that believes both of these things. That's not the point. The concepts are the point. But here's, here's how it works. Eating meat is wrong. Does anybody here believe eating meat is wrong? Don't raise your hand. I'm just asking you to think. We're in Texas, right? Most people don't believe eating meat is wrong, but some people do. So what do you do? You say, well, go back to California, right? I've heard that. You vegetarian, go back to California. Is that really the attitude we're supposed to have? What if somebody in here is a vegetarian and for ethical reasons, not health reasons, but for ethical reasons, they decide not to eat meat. Now, 1 Corinthians 8 is talking about eating meat that's offered to an idol. It's, it's not inferred here in Romans 14 that that's the case. He's actually saying someone who eats herbs. It's not just about eating meat that's offered to idols, but eating meat in general. What if they think it's wrong? What if they think there are certain days that religiously we must observe? You got a good idea of who this person is, okay? Now let's look at the other person. Someone who disagrees wholeheartedly. 
who says, not only is eating meat not wrong, eating meat is allowed. And I can eat meat, and you can't tell me I can't eat meat, even though you believe eating meat is wrong. I'll eat meat if I want to. Eating meat is allowed. And they say, look, your holy day deal, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. A day is just a day. You don't need to worry about days and keeping certain days. A day is just a day. Now, theologically, who's right? Theologically. The one in yellow. Theologically, he's correct. How do we know? Because Paul said that forbidding or to command to abstain from meats that God gave to be received with thanksgiving is a doctrine of the devil. Ha! We're right. Theologically, it's okay. Theologically, every creature of God is good and I can eat anything I want as long as I thank God for it. Theologically. Okay, theologically... The one who says a day is just a day and I don't have to keep the holy days is correct. Why? Because Paul says the same thing. He says because the old law was blotted out and Christ took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the principalities and powers, let no one judge you in food or drink in regard to a festival, new moon, or Sabbath. You know what these are? Holy days. And what's Paul say? You don't have to keep holy days. That's okay. You don't have to keep holy days. So theologically, the one in yellow is right. But who's wrong in the relationship with God? Neither one. Neither one. What does he say? The person who doesn't eat meat, doesn't eat meat, and he does it to honor the Lord, and he thanks God. The person who keeps the day, keeps it unto the Lord, and he thanks God and does it to honor God. And therefore, what's he saying? So who are you to judge another man's servant? He does that to honor God. Remember, this is not about doctrine. It's not about commandments. This is about those things where the Bible hasn't really said, you must do this. So here's the thing. The Bible never says, you must eat meat. It never says that. It's a liberty. You can choose to eat meat or you can choose not to eat meat. God doesn't care either way. You know what God cares about? That you recognize that he's God and he's the giver of all things and you do what you do to honor him in that liberty. In that liberty. And so the man that eats meat, he thanks God for the meat, and he eats the meat. And he says, hey, look, a day's just a day. It's not a special day, but guess what I'm going to do on this non-special day? Honor the Lord. <laughs> and it's about honoring the Lord. Now, this is pretty cut and dry, right? Mm -hmm. No, there's another element of this that we have to consider. And, it's, and here's the element. What I do to honor God is not just about me and God. It's not just about my personal relationship with God. Because I've been put within a body. And what I do affects you and what you do affects me. So I can't just look at it from, well, I'm going to have my personal conviction. I also am commanded here, number one, if you're the person who believes the liberty that someone else is exercising is wrong, don't you judge them and don't you condemn them because they're the servant of God, not yours. And if you're the person who has the liberty... And you look at somebody else and you think, well, how shallow and narrow-minded are they that they think that that should be something they should restrict themselves from? He says, don't you despise that person. Now, what does that mean, despise? Does it mean hate? No, it means treat them with contempt as though they're a lesser Christian. We're one. Our traditions are different, but we're one. And the last thing that we want to do is allow our traditions and personal convictions to destroy the church of God. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Not a person in here will stand before the judgment seat of Ian. And I will not stand before the judgment seat of you. I will stand before the judgment seat of God. Now there's things that God has commanded us to hold each other accountable on. And those are things in doctrine, in morality, and in worship. But tradition, if they don't violate the word of God clearly, what's he say? Don't judge each other. Every knee will bow to God. Every tongue will confess. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of your brother. So rather than putting our focus on looking at what every other person is doing traditionally, what we need to be worrying about is how can I make sure that my traditions don't create a stumbling block for my brother? How can I exercise my liberties in a way that's not going to cause conflict 
and division and be a hindrance to him in walking with God and being a part of the body. That's got to be our focus. Not, well, I've got the right to do this. And I know that's an American thing, right? I've got the right to do this. I've got the privilege. And who are you to tell me I don't have the right to do that? Well, I'm a nobody, but God is. And God says, if you exercise your rights or your liberty in a way that grieves your brother, you've got a problem. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean of itself. But if it's unclean to anyone who thinks it's unclean, it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. Now here's the biggest part of Paul's teaching in Romans 14. It's to compel us to walk in love. Not walk in your tradition, not walk in your liberty, not walk in that what you think is your personal conviction, but to walk in love. And so I need to listen to my conscience when I'm thinking about personal convictions because if I violate my conscience and I do that which I believe is wrong, I've committed sin. But I've also committed sin if I, because of my liberty, do something that grieves my brother. That grieves my brother. This is the greater principle. This I pray that your love may abound still more and more in what? Knowledge and all discernment. Romans 14 is about things in the realm of knowledge and discernment, correct? It's about judgment. And what's he say? What rules, what rules is not my opinion or yours. What rules and reigns is love. And love needs to abound. Why? So we can approve the things not that are good, but that are excellent. That we may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Love must abound in every decision that we make. Everything that we know and discern, love must abound. Which means I don't consider myself, I consider you. And you know what Paul said? You, you read what he said earlier at the end of 1 Corinthians 8, didn't you? If eating meat causes my brother to offend, I will not eat meat. I will not eat meat while the world stands. How many of us have that heart? If somebody told you tomorrow, you cannot eat beef ever again because you're going to cause your brother to stumble. You know what we do? Avoid the brother. Wouldn't we? Paul says, no, that's not our mindset. Because here's the thing. I can eat meat and be right with God. I cannot eat meat and be right with God. But what I can't do is eat meat and cause my brother to stumble and be right with God. I can't do that. So we have to make decisions. Now you say, well, that's unfair. Why would we let the weak dictate what the strong do? Because they're weak. You say, well, what do you do about it? Teach. You teach. You don't grieve them, and you teach. And so if there is a, a, an area where somebody is having problems, can we teach? Yes, but we must approve the things that are excellent. We must do things to the glory and praise of God. And, and when it all boils down to it, if we destroy the kingdom over food, we've missed the point of the kingdom because the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom. And these people that are dividing over tradition, they're destroying that very thing. They're destroying the righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you why. Because when I'm grieving my brother, that's not joyful. When I'm calling into question my brother's salvation based on a personal conviction, they question their rightness with God, and that's not righteousness. And when I do that, I cause division. The kingdom of God is not about all these traditional things and beliefs and personal convictions we have. And when they get in the way of what God came to do through Christ Jesus, we have stepped out of bounds. And now something that's not a salvation has become a salvation, and something that wasn't sinful has become sinful. Not because of the practice itself, but because of the impact that it has with on someone else in the body. So verse 19, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace. Why? Because peace rules in our heart, and that's what we're called to. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense, who violates his conscience. So, last verse of the day before we draw our conclusion here. The faith which you have, have it as your own conviction before God. So I've thought in the past this was a prohibition by Paul to never talk about traditional disagreements. Kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? But didn't he just violate that by doing that very thing? 
He just spent a whole chapter talking about differences and even made the statement, I know that I can eat meat and the Lord Jesus said I could. So if, if that's not the point. What is the point here? He's talking about the way we exercise our own convictions. You want to practice that and do that to honor God? Do that and practice it to honor God, but don't flaunt it in front of other people and cause division and problems. You believe you have to do something? Well, do that, but don't do that to grieve someone else. Have it between you and God and make sure it doesn't get in the way of this. It doesn't need to get in the way of this. So, unity and disagreement. I just want to go through some quick bullet points before we close to kind of recap because I know we have went through a lot of information. So number one, each person should avoid practicing anything that contradicts or violates God's command, right? Very simple concept. Traditions cannot violate God's command. Number two, when someone else exercises their liberties, even if it bothers us, given the wisdom that Jesus gave to the Pharisees, let's take that wisdom, we should carefully and scripturally examine it and use righteous judgment considering the greater principles. That is a foundational part of us being united in these personal convictions. Each person should exercise their conviction or liberties in a way that doesn't create division or stumbling blocks. I know I've hammered that over and over. The manner that we exercise those liberties should promote peace and edification. That was the greatest point of Paul's letter and his chapter in Romans 14. And each person should receive and value their brother and abstain from judging them based on personal convictions. So, if we're going to do that, here's some things we need to always remember. We're part of a body. You know, if we could just always keep that in the forefront of our mind, a lot of this stuff would just be a non-issue. If I always interacted and I talked and I, and I, and I did what I did, always thinking about, hey, look, before you do this, you're part of a body. So really think about, is this going to affect the church? Is it going to affect my brothers and sisters? If we just did that, a lot of this other stuff would fall in place. Number two, Jesus is the head of that body. Jesus is the head of that body. He rules. He reigns. At the end of the day, I don't get to be king, and I don't get to decide what's right for other people when God hasn't said that something's right or wrong. And love demands that I value your soul above my tradition, opinion, or conviction. You know what? That is a hard pill to swallow, but that often is the truth. And you've seen it, haven't you? You've seen somebody sacrifice brotherly love on the altar of their opinion. You've seen it, haven't you? I've done it. We cannot do that. Do not destroy the work of God. For the sake of a personal conviction. I hope the lesson has been helpful for you this morning. Uh, more than that, I hope that it helps each one of us strive to be united and navigate these somewhat difficult situations when it comes to areas of judgment. If you're not a child of God and you're not part of the body of Christ, we want to ask at this time, invite you to come and become a part of that body, be united with Jesus. If you are a part of that body and you've been struggling in your life, we also offer the invitation for you as well. Come have a seat and let us help you as we stand and we sing.